with culture, you're only as good as like the worst people in your company, un unfortunately. And so you have to hire good. You have to be picky. You can't fly by the hole, throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Right. Like you have to, again, be intentional with it. All right. Welcome to another episode of Culture Camp where I have one of my favorite people. I feel like he's the man of mystery because he is kind of <laughs> everywhere. Um, I got Kyle Nielsen with me, and he is the president of Aptive in Environmental, been in direct sales and sales manager for over 15 years. He's an entrepreneur helping scale Aptive Environmental to become the fifth largest pest control in the nation. He's a husband, a father of two amazing kids, and I know you're a huge family man. He's one of the biggest sneaker heads I've ever seen in my entire life, and I feel like he's famous for it. He's a car enthusiast and has a badass Acura NSX. It's, what is it? Um... Type R. It's the type, new S, type, yeah, R, type, type S. S. Type yep. S. Um, he's a car enthusiast. He's an NBA elf, which is an interesting story. We'll get to that. <laughs> he's a beard grower that looks amazing. He's a fun haver. He's the plug and a professional connector of people, places, and experience. And he loves giving. Firm believer that the more you give and the more you get. Kyle, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Dude, I appreciate you so much for being on this. Like, you don't understand how, like, you were one of the first people. I was like, man, I got to get Kyle on here because of I, I see from a distance kind of what you do and the teams that you've created and with this being called culture camp, I feel like you've built an amazing culture and even brand within yourself. And I feel like within your company. So, um, you know, I like to start with people's stories. Like, how, like and I, you have an unreal story. You sent me a YouTube video last night and I watched it and uh -huh. I'm like, man, this, this guy is like gone through some stuff, some, some, some gnarly stuff. So tell us about, you know, your story and kind of how you, how, what led you to Aptip. Awesome. Yeah. So I grew up in San Bernardino California. So, you know, not the nicest place in the world. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just had a, had a good life. My dad had his own plumbing company growing up. So I saw kind of what it took to kind of run a company and run a business. Um, when I was younger, he sold his company off to kind of become a, a foreman for another construction company. He was like, ah, I'd rather focus on my craft versus all of like all of the other things. And he right. wanted to have a little bit more freedom with the family and things as well. And so I grew up spending my summers doing plumbing, digging ditches, hanging pipes, like just doing all wow. the, all the heavy labor, you know, stuff. And, right. and, uh, so I mean, hard work was never like, a uh, a, th a thing that I had to question if I could do it or not. Um, but growing up doing all that heavy labor and seeing the toll that it took on my dad, like the construction people, he had two knees replaced, like a shoulder surgery, like. I was like, man, I, I I need to find a way to work smarter and not like physically hard. Right. right? And so, so I saw him doing that, <clears throat> that construction pays well, but when you're one of six kids and, oh yeah, you know, like making six figures a year even in California, in California doesn't go very far. And so I was the middle kid. So if I wanted, you know, a new pair of shoes for this, for school, for the school year, a backpack, if I wanted, you know, to go to scout camp or play baseball i had to fundraise i had to sell things i had to work okay and um so that's kind of where i first got my like taste in sales like we'll, we'll, we'll kind of fast forward i guess to aptive at, at right. you know some point um so from but, the beginning you were basically doing door to door yeah yeah <laughs> i mean like if i wanted you know if i wanted to play baseball i had to sell the boxes of chocolates you know right. and, and so that's kind of i realized that people want to help people and right. that sales was really just a transfer of enthusiasm and a transfer of like energy. And, uh, which by the way, you have like a very positive energy about you. I, I don't know. I'm sure you get that a lot, but every time I see you, you're smiling, you're having a great time. You're around everybody. Like it's like, I'm a like, man, like Kyle's got it. Like he's got the it factor. No, no wonder why you're so successful. I mean, life's too short to like have a frown on your face more than just you know, more than you need to, to like get it out of your system. You right. know, no, like, that, that's really good advice. I, I like that. So, for sure. um, yeah, so I kind of grew up there. Um, and then kind of fast forward to like high school years, played water polo, swam, I did those things, kind of got into the skateboard scene a little bit, did okay. some film stuff. Um, again, just always kind of hustling with little, little things here and there. And then kind of my life really pivoted towards active, uh, in 2003, my, my house burned down. Jeez. Um, I can't even imagine. Yeah, that. it was, it was crazy. So my, my great grandpa built the home. Like he, he owned right. a brick, he owned a brick company is it was his bricks and his, you know, his like literal blood, sweat and tears. Like the bricks went into the home that he built. 
and uh, my mom like inherited the the home, and right. um, so that burned down big piece of our like family history, oh. our childhood. But that's what moved me and my family, and got me kind of out of my circle that was kind of holding me back. Right. Like I don't look at it as a, tra- as a tragedy at all. Like everything good in my life has happened because of because of that. Wow. Um, put me in the the path and the like circle of people that my wife was in. Put me in the path of the people that I work with now at Aptive. Um, put me on a path that, you know, allowed me to go do a service mission or a service trip to Mexico and, and learn a new language and That's just cool. really embrace some stuff. And it was really just a, a like, if I had to look back, like that tragedy was the best thing. It was a huge blessing. Yeah. Best thing that ever happened. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's unique because most people would look at that and say, you know, this is why I'm not successful. Is in mm-hmm. 2003 I had a fire and I lost everything, and this is why I'm, you know, on the streets. So this is what, ha- like, you know, and you use it as fuel to, yeah, or fuel, and then it cha- it, it it forced you to change. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that's and that's really what life is about, right? Like, right. Um, if you're in your comfort zone, you typically don't want to get out. Like, the hardest thing to do every morning is get out of bed, right? Right. Like, oh, you're yeah. In your blankets, you're covered <laughs> up, you're comfortable, and like you know, the second I uncover, the second I shift, the second I get out, like I'm uncomfortable for a second there's a shock there's the adjustment right and so like that was i didn't have a choice like that pushed me out of my comfort zone like the house was gone my neighborhood was gone like everything was gone so there was no going back right and so from then it's just been for me it's like how what else can i do to step out of my comfort zone like what else can i do and and i've I've found that through my time mexico through my career in sales through networking with the nba players and building all these different things that I, that I'm doing, like the more you step out of your comfort zone, the, the bigger your comfort zone becomes. Right. And so it's, it's, uh, that was an amazing, like amazing tragedy. Uh, and, and honestly, I, I won't ever say anything bad about it. That that's powerful. I mean, yeah. I mean, people really, I mean, they're like, I was t- told once, like, you know, in, in almost anything, there's a blessing or a lesson. Mm-hmm. And sometimes there's both. And this kind of sounds like, you know, it was definitely a blessing on your family and, and what happened and it propelled you to where you are now. Yeah. And it, and it kind of opened the door to a company that you've been a part of for a very long time. I think, I think in your bio, it's since 2007. Yep. 2007. So coming on your 15 year anniversary, I guess this is 15 year anniversary. Yeah. And it's kind of changed the the trajectory of your life. hundred percent. I mean, you went from San Bernardino not living in the best part of town. I remember your, your bio's nuts. I mean, you saw people get. Yeah, I saw, you know, saw a couple people get shot across the street from me at like a high school graduation party that got out of hand. And like, geez. it was nuts. Yeah. And now, now you're, you're doing very well. You're successful. Mm-hmm. You have a gnarly car. You have a gnarly career. Um, you know, literally everybody, I feel like. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if there's a single person out there that doesn't know you. And, you know, and you started at, and you have an interesting story because you started literally at the bottom Mm -hmm. in your company. Tell tell us more about that. Yeah. So I started off with a, with the company as a technician. So I was, you know, the blue collar in the trenches, spraying the houses, walking up to the homes, dead rats, like, you know, like (laughs) all the good stuff. (laughs) It really, I was kind of for the while back to like the sweat of your, your brow kind of thing. And, And the plan was to go to do that job, go to film school like get my film degree and that, you know, that totally shifted. Right. Um, but, but I started off with that and, and I, I can admit going into that, that I was kind of like anti sales people. Okay. Um, granted I had had to sell like boxes of chocolates and wrapping paper for school and like lemonade stands, like those things like, but that was all out of necessity. Like, right. okay, this is my way to make money. I have to do it. But to, to say at that point in my career that I wanted to be like a career salesman, um, I, my, my mind was like every salesperson is, you know, that typical used car, yep. like the sales, like the, 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 the typical one from like the nineties, you know, slick back slick hair, hair, like yep. smooth talking yep. sawdust in the, you know? <laughs> um, and, uh, and so for me, like I, what actually opened my eyes to sales as a career and sales as like a, as, as, as traits that like be like salesmanship as something that super important that I think everybody needs to have and develop was really the, the leadership there. Right. Oh yeah. So the, the team leader at the time was Vess Pearson and he's the CEO of Aptiv now. Okay. Um, so he was one of the team leaders there, Chase Williams. He's one of my, one of the other presidents in the company. 
um, they were, you know, sales reps and team leaders. Right. And so I was around them in the mornings before I was out in the field. I was servicing their accounts they were selling. Okay. And as I was observing them, like from afar, whether they, I was in my the chemical shed organizing stuff and I was listening to their their meetings and, and things like, right. it's like, oh, these, these guys aren't your, your typical summer sales bro, like tools, right. right. You know, and Cause there is that out there. Yeah. I mean, there, every, every company has a few, right. Uh, stereo, you know, stereotypical right. salespeople, sales bros, tools, whatever you want to, you know, whatever right. you call them. Sales bros. I like that. And, uh, it, but, but th- these people weren't it. And as I was showing up to their homes, the, the customers knew what to expect. They had their expectations set correctly. I wasn't having to re-solidify and resell people for them. Like I was like, wow, like these guys are doing this. And then one day I came across a pay scale of like what they would make in a summer. And I was like, wow, like these guys can make what in a summer. And like it, the gears kind of started right. turning. Okay. Uh, so one day I was driving home and traffic in, in Southern California is like a nightmare, right? Like, um, my drive was about 30 miles, but end of day you're sitting in, it's about an hour, half, two hours of traffic. Right. And so I was like, I'm going to go try sales. So I literally in my company truck pulled off the freeway, drove into a neighborhood, parked my truck, started knocking doors. Really? And like no training, no sales manual, like nothing. Wow. And, uh, sold like six houses, sprayed them all right there jumped back on the freeway a few hundred dollars richer and, you know, drove home to my wife. And wow. I was like, wow, this, this was actually wasn't that bad. I, I thought it was because my truck was there and I was in like my dingy technician uniform. Like I was like, it's not me. It's, it's the, it's the uniform. Like right. they knew that I wasn't a salesman. They knew I'm a technician. And like, but then I realized, Hey, like it actually was salesmanship and sales skills. So uh technician a uh, year later, I was a service manager. They promoted me up to kind of manage the service uh, the service techs, um, 2009, they had me move up to the Bay area and actually start the Bay area branch. So, um, I lived in like Tracy, California. So inland worked down from Livermore up through like Pleasanton, the like Berkeley, like the whole East Bay, South Bay, North Bay. Right. And, uh, started the branch, bought the trucks, payroll, hiring, firing, routing, chemical, per- like I was doing everything. Right. And, and that was really, really eye opening to like what it takes to start up a company and start up a branch. And that was a brand new, it was a brand new brand. We had had sold a lot of work to do. We had sold off our previous customer base and brand to Terminex. And so this was a brand new name. So registrations, licensing with permitting, everything was all new. Wow. And, uh, the owners were managing it from like from afar, they were managing it remotely. And there were four, four of us that were opening up new branches. And so it was kind of a, a, a big, like my first taste, I guess, at the startup life Mm -hmm. and, uh, which is rough. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, back then, like it was like, we had the ownership, like was like, don't buy, don't buy two ply toilet paper. Like we can't afford two ply, like buy buy the one ply. (laughs) Like, and like, and, and like, it was so like bootstrapped at the beginning. And, you know, now we have an NCAA size basketball court at our headquarters. Like, wow. It's, yeah, maybe you have three ply, yeah. four ply now. Oh yeah, yeah, four, four, five ply toilet paper. <laughs> it's the thickest stuff out there. <laughs> yeah. Custom made for Afton. Um, it's like quilted, quilted, quilted Northern for sure. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so so I was a uh, branch manager there, and I, I still sold a little bit here and there on the you know, on the side. I'd, if I hit traffic, I'm like, I can either sit in traffic, or I can go make some extra money. Right. And so I kind of started doing that a little bit here and there, and then. Um, doing sales rep payroll that year as the branch manager, I got to see kind of all the numbers and stuff. And I was like, wow, these managers are making in a full year or in a full, in a three, three, four month summer, what I'm making in a full year. Right. And I was like, man, I'm on the wrong side of the company. I gotta, (laughs) I gotta, I gotta switch things up. And so I had promised my wife, we'd never live in Utah. Like (laughs) we're both California born, right. California felt like home. Uh, And I was like, yeah, we're never going to live in Utah. I promise we're never going to live in Utah. But the more I got to know the the ownership group and the people that I was working around and like the opportunity that was here, it actually wasn't a bad, wasn't a hard sale. Um, Living in the Bay area, which is one of the most expensive places to live by far for sure. We had to live an hour from my office just to afford a place because the closer apartments or or we could have lived in an apartment, you know, one bedroom for three grand a month, you know, close to that, you know, it was so stupid, dude. I mean, I, don't know what that's what that's like even now you know it's oh i can imagine what it is it's ridiculous um 
So I talked to my wife, said, hey, I feel like we should move to Utah. I want to go move over to the sales side of the company. I want to help them grow. And it, it didn't stem from this, like, I have to sell. It stemmed from the the company could only, any company can only grow as fast as they have customers, clients, they're selling. Like, right. like you're, you're in the RV business. Like, yep. you can't open up a whole nother dealership if. Unless they're sales. Unless they're sales, unless right. you're moving product. Right. That's what, that's what keeps the doors open and is sales. So that year, there were four offices. I had the best company or customer retention, the best employee retention, the like the highest profit margins in the like in the in the out of the four. Like I had the best performing branch in wow. in, in in the four locations, and I was the youngest, novice, non experienced guy. The other How three, old were you? Twenty five. Really? Yeah, twenty twenty five. Okay. Um, and then the other three branch managers had been in the industry for five, six, seven, ten, ten 10, years. They'd been on the sales side. They'd switched over. Like these guys were experienced dudes. Right. And so I was talking to the CEO and I said, Hey, like I had the best branch. Like, when can I, when can I become a regional manager and when can I like move up? What's my, what's my path on right. the operation side? And they're like, well, these people have been here already and they have the more experience. And I'm like, yeah, but I had the best office. Like, right. <laughs> I had, I had the, the numbers. I had the, I had the results. Sure. Like I should be able to, to grow. And they're like, well, we can only grow as fast as we have sales reps coming in. And so I said, well, if I want a chance to grow, then I need to be on the sales side. Like that's the side that's not like damned. Right. Like, and for the op side to grow, if I wanted to open up two or three new locations, we needed three offices of sales reps, right. you know, to, to open that up. And so, um, I was like, well, that's, this isn't the side for me. And, and if it's going to take, you know, four or five years for us to get to eight, 10, 12 more locations, if we're looking at seniority only, I'm the bottom of the totem pole right now. Right. And so for me to become some sort of regional operations manager or COO or like VP of operations or to have some sort of trajectory there, like it was, it was years down the road. Right. Or I had to bank on someone else, like moving on to something else that was above me. And so I just didn't like the whole pecking order and decided, Hey, like I'm gonna go on the sales side and moved to Utah, packed up our stuff and started recruiting. Like I was literally standing south of the, the duck pond at BYU, <laughs> like catching people on their way off of campus. Hey, like, do you have a job that lined up this summer? Hey, what are you going to be do for, what are you gonna do for work this summer? Hey, what did you do for work last summer? Right. Uh, knocking apartment doors. Like, wow. Like, You're door to door selling sales. Yeah. Was, <laughs> and like, and, and like a lot of other companies were like doing these pizza meetings, these information nights. And like, we did some of those too, but I was like, Hey, what time is our, you know, what time are all your people, are all your roommates going to be home? They're like, oh, seven. Okay. I'm going to come talk to you guys tonight at seven o'clock. I'll bring pizza. I'll bring food to you guys. Just let me talk to you guys for 10 minutes. Wow. Okay. And like, I would just, I was hustling. And so I built my own team. And then, um, 2010, I, uh, sold, went to Phoenix, Arizona, my first summer to knock doors in the, uh, nice, cold, lovely, Oh yeah. Wonderful weather of Phoenix, Arizona. It was AC blowing all the time. Oh dude, it was, it was, it was miserable. Jeez, but we've had a hot spell here in Utah. Oh, dude, it's yeah, it's, it's I can't been warm. Yeah. I can't imagine in Phoenix. Yeah. So it's hundred degrees at night. Dude. Yeah. It, it, it would not cool down. Like my daughter was three weeks old. It's like during you this take whole, your family. Yeah. So during this whole transition, like I decided to change jobs, go from a salary job, company vehicle, company card, company phone, company insurance to then go straight commission. Right. Leave all the, all the perks of the all safety. the, all the safety. Yeah. The right. safety of, of that behind. And we find out my wife's pregnant, like no more health insurance, <laughs> like not nothing. Like it was, it was, uh, it, it, to me, like it was a sink or swim. Like it was, right. we made this transition. I can't go back. You don't have a choice. You I, have to, I had to succeed. succeed. Like, yeah. And so I moved down to Arizona. My daughter was three weeks old, left them in Utah, you know, told my daughter, told my wife had her like six week checkup, like postpartum. Right. Check up. And then I flew back up, drove them down and you know, they lived at the pool during the summer at the right. apartment complex. And I would lived on the street <laughs> you know, in the heat. And I remember I have a picture on my phone of like a mailbox that was like melted over like the post and everything. It just kind of like what melted and like, was just like sprawling out on the ground. Like, dude, it, it was hot. Jeez. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but like Welcome I wouldn't do your first summer, but yeah, but again, like, I wouldn't change it. Like I, like we right. had eight locations at that point. Um, 
Phoenix was probably my number nine choice of like the eight of where to go to. (laughs) And I ended up in Phoenix, like dead last choice to go, but it was the best decision for me again. Like because of the grit, the, the sweat, like the literal tears some days, like and you, you've experienced like in yeah. sa- dude, sales is it's up and down, it's up and down. Um, and it's emotionally up and down. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that kind of that fire, like that heat, like really like purified me. Like it, it strengthened me. It like showed me who I was. It showed me who my teammates were, showed me who on my team were quitters and who weren't, who I want to work around, who I don't want to work around. Like, I want to work on people that can, that can get through the the suck and right. get through the tough part of the the job. And so that year, um, I, I'll be honest, like I lost like half my sales team, like half my team quit. Really? And, and that was like, our company was about 85% would typically finish the summer. Okay. And like 50% of my reps on that year, it fin- <laughs> like finished. And wow. he, I mean, it just, it was, it was tough. Like it, right. it was hard. Um, and not only that, but you were, you, we were in such a competitive market where any given day there'd be three other pest control companies knocking the same streets really? we were knocking. So like, imagine, I mean, imagine like, you know, you having like six RV dealerships competing all on different corners, like, right. like a roundabout and then like dealerships. Yeah. You that's, know? there is a place like that in California yeah, and it's, it's tough. It's in Colton. Yeah. Colton. Colton. Yeah. Colton, it's off, where, it's off the 215. Yep. I grew up, by, that's why, right yeah. where I grew up. Yeah. There's like a row of Mike Thompson's yep. and the camping world, all these, like, you know, they're all right there. And it's just like, they just drive down. I think there's six of them. Yeah. They just drive down and they go, Oh, Hey, that guy's giving me a better deal. And it's like a bloody blood bath. Oh yeah. There. No, it is. And like, it's, it's sharks in the water. Like yeah. it really is. And so, so I, I sold that year, kind of co-managed a team um, rebuilt, kind of rebranded myself, who I wanted to be around, who I wanted to attract, uh, the next year sold in Utah, managed a team the following year, became a division manager with the company, um, which was kind of managing my own team and plus like two to three other smaller teams and scaling. And then, uh, the next year was a regional manager, then a VP, then a senior VP of sales and now president of sales with the company. Dude, that's unreal. How, how did, like, what taught you building teams? Like, is there any, is there a person that was like, oh, this person taught me, I read books, like, yeah. you know, you, you started as a technician and most of the times, you know, technicians are a personality, anything, car technician, mm. you know, pest control tech, like usually it's just, hey, I'm a team of one, I'm going to stick to myself, they're usually introverted, yeah. I, well, I, I knock the door, I don't even really want to go to the door, just please don't be home, I want to spray around the house, yep. I got I don't got to go inside, and get my truck and move on and like usually you know car technicians mm-hmm. i like to stay in the bay they don't like to deal with customers and you know you flipped upside down because you were that and then even operations because a lot of operations yeah. people don't see a frontline customer base right mm-hmm. they're like they're kind of behind the scenes on things w- what taught you to you know the people skills or who taught you like because yeah. there's a lot of people out there that maybe are introverted or maybe are that technician or are whatever and they want to go to the next level they're just they don't know how to to get in front of people because there is that barrier yeah in, in that right there so yeah why you like why did you do that yeah i mean I, I guess like full disclosure like i'm i'm an extroverted introvert like i actually like at the end of the day i like to just kind of sit quiet don't like all the, the noise and like, that's like where I feel the most like clear and like clarity, right. you know, I think, I, and that's, I think anybody that's getting into like cold plunges and meditation and breathe, you know, I think you feel that there, but like, right. I, I was kind of forced to be an extrovert. I'm one of six kids, middle child, four brothers, one little sister, like that was rowdy growing up. And like, so that was like, we were a team and my dad was really big at getting us together for Saturdays, for activities, for camping trips. And I think that seeing how like we could take even his siblings, like personalities are different. Right. Um, energies are different, but you have to make it work. Like you have to share a room with a brother or I mean, at least I, you know, I had to, I had to, I had I had to, to share a room with two brothers that, you know, yeah. at one point until ninth actually, grade. Yeah. I, most I shared. Exactly. Shared it wasn't until my older brothers started moving out and going to college yep. and stuff that like, Me I was too. like, got in my own room. Finally, yep. you know, I'm like, just get my sister, get, get yep. married and move out. So yep. my brother Joe could move back in yep. her house. And Cause like, even my sister, my, she's the youngest. She had her, you know, her own room before any of the boys did. Right. Um, so that, that helped obviously the, the house burning down and like getting forced into new groups of people and like getting forced to kind of integrate with, with different people helped a lot living in Mexico city, like being a minority, 
somewhere, right. learning a different language. Like those all, all help. But I, I really, I would say that it was my video, my video work. Like I, I'd made videos in high school. I filmed skateboard, you know, videos for a while. Uh, me and my friend Daniel Wurz had a production company called Synoptic Productions. And we okay. do like wedding videos and highlight videos and sponsor videos for like college applications. And we were doing like some of the local skate shops and amateur guys. We were doing sponsor videos for them. And, uh, that's it. That to me, like in an introverted state, like I'm sitting in front of a computer. Right. But the goal was to turn chaos into beauty. Right. The goal was to take, um, and like Murphy, who's, who's here. Shout out Murph. My um, guy. <laughs> like my guy, Murph. like Murphy posts a lot of times he posts these pictures of, of the timeline that he's working on, like for the video and like cut, 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 cut. It's like, if you were to walk up and not know what he was looking at, like you'd be looking at, like, it's just, it is it's chaos. Right. But then you click play and it's a beautiful video. Right. And so that, that the creative side of me, like the turning chaos into beauty, um, taking a video and something I did with, with skateboarding videos and things back then was that I would take the music. A lot of times people just took their videos, put it to music and that was it. Like quick edit out. And I would take it. Um, I learned this from my, my friend, Daniel. Uh, we'd take the video and when, like the skateboard would hit the rail, we would make sure it hit at the the beat of the music. And we, if we had to speed up the video footage to then slow it down, when the skateboard landed on the ground, it was always on a beat. It was okay. always in sync. And so it, it made the, the viewing of it without people knowing it subconsciously. It was like, it just made it feel better and right. made it feel more in sync. It made it feel like a dance. Like it was, it was, it was intentional with that song. And, and so that was really my, my first kind of round of, like the chaos and the beauty principle. And I kind of kept that with me uh, when I became a you know sales leader, manager, recruiter, even on the operation side, when I was building my first team of technicians, I hired intentionally with, I, I, I hired one young guy that was super, super um, energetic. He was like, I have to be the best born to be the best. He's like ex military, like, sir. Yes, sir. Good day to be here, sir. Thank right. you, sir. <laughs> and then I, you know, he was super young and energetic then I hired, you know, this, this older guy that came in and I, um, he, uh, like I think it was, he was post retirement age, but had tons of energy still. Like he was just the old work mentality, like start at sun up, don't go home till sundown. Like, right. So I, I, I figured if I can get this one guy that's super energetic and this other guy that has insane work ethic and have them be the leaders that I focus on the fence sitters and everyone else in between are going to gravitate towards these people. Right. And, so if you, if you have too many, you know, the whole too many chiefs, not enough Indians, or mm -hmm. are we allowed to say that I, nowadays? I think so. Or yeah, hopefully Apple know. doesn't take me off the podcast, but we're <laughs> too, good. <laughs> too many, too many leaders and not enough, um, followers. I don't, I don't know. I've, yeah. Who knows what we can even say now? I don't even know <laughs> what we can like, say now. Um, but yeah, I mean the, the, the too many chiefs, not enough, um, Indians, um, where if you have too many people that are trying to kind of push for the spotlight, like it just becomes chaotic. Like there's been like a joke of like, if every, if, if LeBron, you know, had clones and they were all on the court at the same time, like who would pass the ball to who, like who, right. would, you know, like it just wouldn't get, wouldn't get done. Right. And so doing that with the, with the leadership that I created, I always kind of, I figured if I can do that in videos and film, if I can do that with people like even better. And so as I would build teams, I was looking for, you know, people that I could help shape and mold and the chaos of, of a team or the chaos of a summer, the chaos of sales and make it into something beautiful, make it a team mm. that was respectable, winning tournaments, hitting goals, hitting benchmarks, hitting their KPIs. Like, right. And so I just, I kind of just took that with me and that's what really put me, I guess would really shape me in the leader that I, that I am is, is just wanting to always take something that was rough around the edges or, or chaotic and make it something beautiful and awesome. That is so so good. I hope people go listen to that time and time again because most people don't build teams strategically. They just kind of hire and hire and hire and kind of throw mud on the wall. Yeah. And whatever sticks, sticks. But you are methodical about, you know, I'm going to hire this personality mm -hmm. that's really good at this. And then they're going to, you know, the things that they're not good at, I'm going to hire someone else to take care of, you know, what they're not good at and kind of keep going down the list. You know, it's like a, it's like a, it is like a basketball team. I mean, you yeah. know basketball. We, yeah. we both sit we do, yeah. pretty much across from each other at yep. the jazz games. Um, one of your seats. 
And, um, you know, it's like, it is like having, you know, like you can't have five LeBrons out there or five point guards or five centers. Yep. That would, that would look, you know, if we had five Rudy's out there, it'd be like, you know, how's the ball, <laughs> how's the ball going to get from one end of the court without the other end of the court without getting stolen, you know, yeah. like what's going to happen. And it's so important to create a team, like a true aspect yep. of a team. And like when I'm doing anything in the RV or any of our other companies, I look at it at the strengths of the teams and I actually have a rating system and a personality mm -hmm. software that actually ranks the entire personality oh, wow. of the team. So e I have their, each of the individual personalities and then I rank their entire team and this is kind of the personality of the team. Wow. So I know if situations arise, this is how going, they're going to react. Okay. And if, you know, if like with customers, this is, this is how they'll react mm -hmm. to customers. And then we have a training program to help them kind of. Oh, wow do things i mean it's very strategic in what we so do. do do you have like your seal team six team like you're, you're yeah we have like okay this is a customer problem we deploy them like yep, it's just nice. you don't go and you know we do have like in our corporate office too like we we want to know how we are going to operate mm -hmm. and i don't want like a bunch of yes men or yes women or yeah. yes people i want people to challenge me and i've always said hey like it's like the knights at the round table okay king arthur wasn't sitting there at the head saying i'm the boss this is how i'm going to do it yeah it's a round table discussion and I need different personalities and different input. Yeah. And I need different ex experience levels. I need someone that's been in the industry for 20, 25 years. I need someone that's been in the street like me not that long because I'm almost like a young child, like blind faith that I don't like, I don't know how they've been doing it for the last 20 years. So I do it maybe a little bit different and yeah. it's a different perspective. So I really, really like the, like you started from the beginning and the foundation and you, yeah. you were with Apta pretty much since the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, at the beginning. Yeah, we had two locations when I started. Yeah. And you, you have, you set the foundation to, to be what it is now. And it's huge. Now, how many offices do you guys got? Um, over 120. Oh my gosh. Like, and so we're yeah, like the fifth largest in the nation now. And uh, last I checked, there was like over 20,000 pest control companies in the nation. Wow. And, and you're so, number yeah, five out of 20,000. Yeah. Dude, yeah, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Um, you know, with, when I say culture, what what comes to mind, and why has that been so important with Aptive? Because I know you you have created a culture not only within yourself and like what you've done, and we can talk that about about that in a minute because yep. you've done some cool things. <laughs> um, but in Aptive, yeah, you know how important is culture, and and it almost goes with branding because when people when and, and even customers feel culture because when you have an Aptive person come to your door how they're going to, you know, their process. And then you have the technician come in their process. That is, that is a brand because it's mm -hmm. active, but it's also a culture where like you feel something. It's like Tesla owners. They just, yeah. they're a little bit different. I mean, I have one. We're a little bit weird, but you know, it's, <laughs> it's like a almost not really like a cult, but it's a culture of people. It's like a club, yeah. you know, and people really like to be in it. And I know after I got a bunch of friends that work for you and they, I don't know if you know that, but a um, ton of my friends actually work for Aptive. Awesome. Um, and they love it. They love the culture. So tell me about, you know, what culture means to you. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, so culture, I think goes along with everything else that we've kind of talked to up to this point is like, it's everything like, and you have to be intentional with it. Just like you have to be intentional with your team building, be intentional with, with how you put people together. You, you want to be intentional with your culture. You want to be tension intentional with, with how you do things. And so I think at, at the core, you just have to have the right effort in, in, in whatever it is you're pursuing and then the right intent. And, right. and you have to be memorable too. Like that is, that is one of the biggest things I think with my own brand too, like with the elf and stuff, we'll talk about that. Like, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure you're, you're <laughs> oh, I'm waiting, I'm waiting to talk about it. Um, but like you have to be memorable. Um, we, I mean, we have, we have in our circle of friends, we have people that own restaurants and experiential dining and, right. and like, if you just went in, oh, I went to it, Sunday's best yesterday. Yeah. Unreal. Yeah. And if you, if you just went there and it wasn't, an experience you just showed up and ate the food and they're like, here's your seat. Like, and they didn't have the music playing and they didn't have the lights and the food, like the presentation, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be one of those things. Like I want to go back and have brunch there again. Right. I mean, it, it, they, Michael's created an amazing, amazing yeah, company. And all of his, you know, all, all, all of his, restaurants. all of his different things that he's done. And so he's, he's intentional. Um, he's memorable. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, he puts in the effort, like the work, the work is there that you can tell the work has been done. Right. And so with our culture, um, and you had mentioned like the word cult, right? Like, right. Like cult is probably, like, culture is probably a, they're probably tied into somewhere. You, you know, know, I probably should look that back, up. Back, back in like <laughs> Latin or something, you know, right. but um, with culture, you're only as good as like the worst people in your company, un unfortunately. And so you have to hire good. You have to be, right. you have to be picky. You can't fly by the hole, throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Right. Like you have to, again, 
be intentional with it. And then with, with, with the, with the branding and being memorable, not only is it memorable with like the, the gear and the clothing and the uniforms, like the little details, it's, it's, it's being memorable with the customer experiences. Like what are the customers going to say? I, I got a, for sure. I spent a lot of my summers knocking doors, honestly, from 2012 to 2020 in Southern California, that was kind of my go-to hub. Um, I, I sold somebody in 2016 got a text from one of the reps that was knocking in Corona the other day, Corona, California. He's like, Hey, I knocked on this customer's door and he remembered you by name, Kyle. Really? He said, does Kyle still work? Does still Kyle still work with you guys? And he's like, yeah, Kyle's the president of the, of the, of the sales, the sales organization now. Wow. Um, and I was like, Hey, what was his name? And like, I looked up his address and like, I remembered vividly like the interaction I had with this customer. Really? Um, and, and again, he was happy with, with the decision. Um, he was happy with what he bought, what he purchased. And, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, like seven years, six years deep as a customer where most customers or most companies have, you know, a, a, most customers have like a two to three year you right. know, shelf life in, in, in that. And so that, that to me like shows that I embodied the culture that we'd worked to build, that I was part of the culture that I was, um, what would the word be? Like I was a culture promoter, like, right. uh, that I was promoting it through, through how I presented the company and how I represented it. And we've just looked for ways as we've scaled and grown to put systems and processes in place along with our branding and our identity to make sure that our culture stayed, you know, strong and true to what we, what we started with. Right. Cause it, I mean, at the end of the day, it is number one. Uh -huh. And I'm sure you have people come in and out of your company that were not great for a culture uh -huh. and they kind of get weeded out quick. I mean, it's yeah. like slow to slow to hire, quick to fire. Yep. And it, you know, I, I always explain it like, it's just like, like accepting cancer into your body. Like you're not yeah. going to do that. Right. No. You're going to keep the cancer out of your body. And the whole point is to, to never have cancer. And so, but it starts from the hiring and 100%. you can't be perfect. I, I have honestly made probably the biggest mistakes oh, in hiring. We all, we all have, but at the end of the day, like it takes a, a like a real person who, who cares more about the culture than like, even if this person is super, good at what they do but they're really bad for the culture yeah. get rid of them yep. because you can kind of teach i call them like the intangibles you can't teach the intangibles you you mm -hmm. can't make someone a good person yep i mean a lot of therapy you can things, influence I'm sure. you, you can, can help but like, at the end of the day like it's up to them yeah but i can teach you how to you know go work on an rv or i can teach you how to go sell it or i can teach you how to go spray you know some some whatever you want to call it. It's not, I won't say herbicide because that sounds bad. Pesticides and products. Pesticides, yeah. Some, some products. S say product, you yeah. know, or like cut hair. Yeah. You, you can teach those things. Yep. But if you're just a straight up like asshole. Yeah. I can't really do much with that. Yep. And so we've had, you know, in our personal company, we've had the greatest people, some of the greatest people in the space mm -hmm. and had to get rid of them because yeah. they just weren't good for the culture. And everybody like basically applauded on their way out and was like, mm -hmm. thank you. Because you know, you, it starts from the top down. Yeah. And if you don't show the bottom person that you care about your culture, like you've been talking about, it destroys everything. Yep. I mean, I, I think that I, mean, I don't think most people get that cause they're just thinking about a dollar. Yeah. And there's yeah. a lot of, there's a lot of companies that out that I mean, not, not, in, not even in direct, the direct sales, but anytime there's like a salesperson or a producer, somebody that's bringing money into the company. Like those people tend to feel untouchable. Right. Right. Like, because they're like, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm making the company say, money. Yeah. I'm doing this. Like, I can do whatever I want. You can't touch me because look like, what I'm doing for look you. Look what I'm doing for you. And, yeah. and a lot of times, like, companies are scared because they're like, this guy is really good at sales or this person's really good at sales. If I let them go, they're going to go to a competitor. Right. And they're, you know, they know all of our training and all of our stuff and all of our secret sauce. They're going to impart that to a, to a competitor. They're going to be a thorn in our side. They're going to recruit against us. And I honestly, you can't live like that. You can't live in fear of holding on to the bad seeds. Like right. just because you don't want, like you don't want them to go sell somewhere else. Like honestly, let, let them, let right. them Yeah. Go. Because let they're bad for sell. your culture. They're going to be bad for their culture because exactly. it's just kind of who they are. And yep. it's like, yeah, it's almost like go over to the person across the street because yeah. you're going to destroy them. Like, yep. don't flee. Yeah. And, you know, I kind of think it like that with inventory. Like we yeah. have in, in trailers, we have lines, like, you know, uh -huh. lines of inventory. And if they're not selling, you know, that's the biggest fear of like, Oh, like still keep them and still order them because the guy across the street's going to get them. Well, if they're sitting on our lot, I welcome. They're going to you know, sit. Go, go, go sit on their <laughs> yeah. lot, please. You know, go over there. We're, you know, screw their inventory dollars up and make them mm. pay more interest. So, you know, I think that's really, really important. And um, it's definitely a lesson that people need to learn is just that, like, the end of the, it's an integrity of your culture. Yep. And don't keep a butt in a seat just because it's a butt in a seat and it's destroying your culture. Yeah. Like, it, 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 
you'll find a way to get through it. Yep. I, I really believe that. So, um, one, one thing, you know, I do want to talk about, <laughs> um, the elf thing. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you've created a brand. It's almost like I go to the jazz games, you know, we always see each other and I'll message you, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, you know, a lot of NBA players and you've created a brand with the elf. Like that's, and it's almost, and you've created a brand of the jazz games mm-hmm. that it's like, where's Waldo? Yep. <laughs> you know, that's, I totally feel like every time I'm like, you know, he's going to have 20 or 30 people, you know, film them and yeah. Take a picture. And I don't even know how that started. Dude, it's like, crazy. <laughs> like I, it's nuts. How, how in networking is a big, a big part of, mm-hmm. you know, what you do and you, you know, I've seen you at a bunch of events and or a couple of events and, um, you know, you're always talking to everybody, everybody knows you, but how, like, how have you been able to grow that network and like these, the jazz players and the, a lot of NBA players, like not just the jazz. I mean, mm-hmm. I was literally watching you bet John, John Morant on the side of the sidelines <laughs> yeah. because we were sitting right next to the bench. Yeah, and he just got a bigger deal, so maybe the bets are going to be bigger, yeah, yeah. bigger with us. Yeah, might have to be careful. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, I mean, that's just so cool. And it really says a lot about you, who, who you are as a person. Mm-hmm. And so how, how did you meet these guys? Like, how, what, yeah, I mean, it's kind of. So I mean, it, with, with a lot, the, the original kind of intro to the NBA kind of players, um, I had actually gotten, uh, I kind of became friends with. Um, one of the, like the barber that cut Royce O'Neal's hair. Okay. Um, Philo, good friend of mine, like good dude. Um, I saw them sitting courtside at a BYU basketball game and saw like all the tags of like Donovan Mitchell, Royce O'Neal, like all the different players. And there was this, you know, five foot something tall, like non NBA player with them. And I'm like, who's that dude? looked him up on his profile, cut hair. And I'm like, I, I love a good beard trim. Like I don't have a whole lot of hair up top, but like, right. I love, you know, love seeing people that perfect their craft again, chaos into beauty. Like, right. So I messaged him and said, Hey dude, you're really good at your stuff. Are you moving to Utah anytime soon? He's like, no, I'm in Texas. And we just, he'd come out to games. We'd, we'd chat, we'd talk and we'd just engage like via. So it was a DM on really? Instagram. And, uh, we, um, we were playing the Warriors. It was the first game where we unveiled like the city edition jerseys court, like back in like 17, I think. Yep. And uh, I was sitting behind the jazz bench, um, got one of the towels, like the first few rows got like the, the you know, the city edition towel and uh, had a few players sign it before the game. Philo comes walking by and I'm like, hey, what's up, man? It's Kyle, the great elbow. Like, he's like, oh, what's up, man? Like we, we talked for a second and um, at the end of the game, he was like, hey, I'm going to be down in the tunnel with all the players after the game. Do you want me to get the towel signed by everybody? Like the towel signed by the whole team. It's so like, heck yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Let's do it. And so give it to him. I, I'm like, I don't have this guy's phone number. We DM each other on Instagram. That's it. He like, just took my towel. He just took like <laughs> this towel that had autographs on it. Like, man, this is, did I make the right call? Um, very trusting. And yeah, I'm a very trusting person. And obviously I feel like I'm a pretty good, uh, reader, reader yeah. of, of, of people. And after knocking hundreds and thousands of oh, doors, yeah. you, you know? would know every personality. Yeah, and I'm sure. And, I'm sure you got some horror stories and some wild stories, especially in California. Oh, dude, yeah, yeah. Knocking doors is is the stories are fun. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm driving home, and he he messages me and says, "Hey, where you at?" I'm like, "I'm driving home." He's like, "Oh, we're heading to Ruth's Chris. Pull up, you know, like come through." So I get off the freeway, flip like, around. Sorry, sorry, baby, I'm you know, not coming home speed, right now. Speed back up to 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 Salt Lake City. Right. Pull into Ruth's Chris. Go into the back room. Um, and it was like me, Royce O'Neal, uh, George, George Niang was there, Donovan Mitchell, Philo, and I think like one or two G league players. Uh, we had one, we'd beat the warriors. So like, of course the energy in the room was pretty good. The TV on the wall, they were watching all the highlights and stuff. I come in and, um, kind of look at what everyone was eating. They were all first year, you know, first year players on the team. They don't have big max contracts and they're all, they're all eating like chicken, you know, maybe a side, but nobody's eating like really, really good. Nobody has like expensive bottles of wine. So I'm like, all right, this is an affordable, like an affordable meal right. for these guys. So in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to find a way to pick up this tab. Like, no, I'm not going to tell them. I'm not going to be like, hey guys, I got it. It's on me. I said, I'm just going to find a way. I'll, I'll talk to the this, the hostess on the way out and say, hey, like that room ticket here, let me pay for it. Right. So I chatted for a little bit, grabbed the towel from Philo, talked for a second but I, I, I read the room and I wasn't, I wasn't going to like sit there and fanboy and I wasn't going to sit there until like everyone was leaving. So right. I was like, Hey guys, you guys just want a game. You, you know, last thing you want is some weird, you know, 
weird dude sitting with you guys you don't know, but like, right. here's who I am. Here's what I'm about. I do have connection to the sneaker world and, you know, finding sneakers, gear, lifestyle gear. If you guys need it, like it's not my full-time job, so I'm not going to be charging astronomical prices. Like it's a hobby of mine. Right. And if you guys need stuff to wear pregame tunnels, red carpets, like, let me know. Here's my number. Boom. And they were all appreciative. We swapped some numbers. I head out and, uh, the whole tab was like 300 bucks. Like, um, at Ruth's? Yeah, I mean, because they were nobody was right. eating big. Yeah, I need to tell my wife to <laughs> yeah. learn from stick that. Stick to stick to chicken and yeah. and Brussels sprouts. Um, <laughs> chicken and water. Yeah, and so so I I headed out and I was like, hey, the, the room back there uh, with the jazz players, I'll pick up the tab, signed it, gave a tip, walk out. Um, get a text from one of the players the next morning. Hey, thanks, you didn't have to do that. Appreciate it. And like, I didn't go back in. I'm like, hey guys, I got it for you. It's right. on me. Like. It wasn't anything like that. It was just it was literally like very sincere. It was just this like, hey, like do something nice and don't even wait around for the reaction. Like, and and just do it. Right. Um, but they knew that. Uh, I think I, what I had done, and I think this is a, an important thing in networking, is, um, you most people wear their emotions on their sleeve. Like right. most people, like if you are wanting to network some with somebody or meet somebody, because you want something from them, like in right. like, that's that's not gonna work. And right. so. Like with what I, with how I network, obviously you can always leverage anybody in your network and leverage isn't a, isn't a bad word. Like people think that leverage in, in like, in ways, I guess on like bad leverage is bad, right. but leveraging what you have and your skill set and your abilities and your people, like that's not a bad thing. And so, right. um, people that you network with are always, they're going to expect you to ask them for something at some point, like any friend, you're going to call a friend and say, can I get a ride to the airport? Hey, my car's broken down or, Hey, my car's in the shop. Can I borrow? Like that's just part of being in your circle. Like, right. you know, and so, but if you're, if you're wanting to meet people just for clout or just for this, or just for, you know, the wrong reasons, like back down to like the intent side of like how right. I try to live my life. Where it's like, you know, it's transactional mm -hmm. instead of like a true yeah. relationship. Yeah. It's, and that's, and that's really, I love that you said transaction. Cause like one of the things that I train my reps on is before you can have a transaction, you have to have an interaction right before you can transact. You have to interact. And the transaction is a byproduct of a good interaction. And so if you meet with somebody, you connect with them, they can see value in you. You can see some value in them. Then of course a transaction of some sort is going to happen down, right. down the road. And so that's, that's kind of where, where I'm at with, with networking and with these guys, I was able to help them not blow all their paychecks on overpriced shoes. Yes. They were spending money on like, expensive shoes and expensive clothes, but they weren't paying four X the price. Right. And, uh, and that was one thing that I had told one of the players I'd said, Hey dude, like there was a guy on a sneaker group I'm on on Facebook bragging about how he sold you a pair of shoes for four times what he paid for them. And I'm like, I could have gotten those for, you know, $50 more <laughs> than, right. than, than, than cost. And like, so if you do that, you know, do that a hundred times, that's hundred thousand dollars. You do that hundred times that's you know a million dollars whatever I, right. I don't do math i just kill bugs you know right. but whatever the math is and <laughs> a I lot said, of money yeah it's a lot of money and you don't you don't like so many players athletes rappers like musicians don't have the right um skills or the education to to save or be smart with it but there is their branding side need they need to have a little bit of the flash and the pizzazz right. as well and so the networking side is um <clears throat> again you have to be you have to interact before you can transact. Um, and so it just kind of, for me, it was more casual and I wanted them to know like my intent behind it was to let them know like, Hey, Kyle is somebody here that can be your advocate, can be here to help you. He's not here to be a fanboy. He's not here to be part of your entourage. He's not here to, to like, like tout like for social media clout. Right. He, he literally just wants to help be a tool if you need him. And, um, you know, and that was it. Like there was no, there was no like other intention behind it. Um, I mean, with, with my networks that I have now, like everything has always just been about helping, finding ways to help and give. Um, I mean, my, even my relationship with like Dan Fleischman and mm -hmm. that whole, that whole group came from them opening up their cards and coffee shop up in Salt Lake. And okay. um, I wasn't a part of it. And I was there opening up boxes and setting up countertops and hanging pictures. And like, I was like, I, knew some of the people that were a part of it and uh, didn't know them all really well. I knew Jimmy Rex and I knew, um, uh, should I know his name? And he's a freaking good friend of mine. My name, my mind's blanking right now. 
um, a Kevin Trost. Like, I don't know. Do you know Kevin? Mm-mm. Yeah. So Kevin, <laughs> sorry, Kevin, if you're watching this, <laughs> um, but Kevin, Jimmy Rex, like I knew some of the people and I was like, these guys, they're going to open up something new that they haven't done before. They're, I'm going to go up and help. And, uh, so they were like, so who is this guy that's helping? And they're like, oh, it's, it's Kyle. He works for this other company. Like, he's just here to help. He's just a good dude. And so I got, you know, introduced third, you know, third person to these amazing people, right. these amazing networks that were, you know, Kyle's a good dude. He's just a helper. He likes to help. He likes to give. And, um, and you know, fast forward to that, like, we hosted Dan at the Elevator Night thing last year at the Jazz Arena. I don't know if you were, you came to that or not. I didn't go to it. Um, been, to some, I, amazing, saw, saw, yeah. been to some amazing events with him. Like, I'm in some amazing text threads and group threads with him with, with investment opportunities and really high level people. And it all came from helping. It all came from being a helper to looking for, for, for ways to give, um, knowing, not expecting to get, but knowing that if you give enough, you're going to get, get right. everything you, you ever needed. And right. so, uh, with the players, sorry, I got off way off topic oh, for a good. second, but with the players, um, they just kind of started texting me, reaching out, DMing me about like certain stuff or, Hey, I have this event or I have this party. What about these shoes? What about this? And yeah, we'd end up at dinner. We'd end up, you know, if I was on the road traveling, um, and I coincided with the jazz game or something, I'd go and like, I'd usually like be able to score some player tickets or something. And, right. um, at the away games and things. And, um, it just kind of really turned into like where now players are calling me saying, Hey, who's a good, my dog needs to get groomed. I need a good groomer here in Utah. Hey, who does your detailing on your cars? Your cars always look super, super clean. I need a good detailer that can come detail my, my, you know, my Rolls Royce or right. my Lambo, you know? <laughs> and, right. and, and so I've kind of become this like concierge the in, plug. In, yeah, the, the plug, like yeah. in, in, in this network of people and, and as trades have happened and things, my name has kind of gotten shared with other people in, you know, in the league. Um, like later today, I'm shipping a pair of shoes to, uh, a player that plays on the suns right now. Um, and uh, needs them for the 4th of July. Like he's like, I, I uh, want these shoes. So I'm going to get them dropped in the mail and like ship them out. Heck yeah. Um, he's not the tallest player on the team. Probably one of the shorter players on the team. A little older. Mm, I know exactly <clears throat> who you're yeah. talking about. <laughs> Chris Paul. Yeah. So that's kind of really, <laughs> that's kind of what's, what's happened with, with that. And then, and then like the, then, then like the elf stuff kind of gets introduced. And so um, Christmas, like we had a Christmas day or Christmas Eve game, I think 2018 and for years, 2009, 10, I bought an elf costume, um, you know, Buddy the Elf, Will Ferrell. Like right. Yep. One of my favorite, you know, comedic actors, like super, super funny dude. He's Su- hilarious. Super obscene and horrible in some cases, <laughs> but like super funny. Right. Like his personality is why he gets these, you know, these roles. And um, we were doing like, um, like a sub for Santa at work. And so I was like, well, if I want my reps to be mem- have a memorable experience, I want them, it's going to be memorable either way, but I want it to be really memorable. So I'm going to wear my elf costume to Walmart, to Target, shopping, wrapping presents, delivering the presents. Like I'm going to don the elf costume and wear it till we're done. Right. And so it, it became memorable. They were like, my, my reps were posting pictures and videos um, as I was walking past, like crying kids with their moms at Target. The kid would stop crying and like laugh and point. The mom would look back and be like, oh, like my kids stopped. My, my kid's not crying anymore. Like, thank you. Like, right. Uh, and I realized that not only were the people that I was interacting with enjoying it and was it not only was that brightening up their lives, like the people that weren't even saying anything to me or weren't even approaching, like the person that saw me from across the parking lot, like, you know, like the, the scene on elf where like he's walking through central park and it looks like Sasquatch, you yep. know, like they yep. see this pointy hat and this wig and uh, like these bright yellow tights. And it's like that person, I don't know what they're going through. I don't know if the person that I walked past in the parking lot that I didn't even look at, smile with, wave to anything. Did they just get fired? Did they just lose a loved one? Are they struggling to make ends meet? Are they, you know, on, on one end, on the other end, are they super, super happy? Like it's, it's only going to be an added benefit or net positive for anybody that I interact with, unless they hate elves and Will Ferrell and right. joy, <laughs> you know, like, um, and so Sounds miserable, right? Yeah. No, it's they're If they're cotton headed ninny muggins, then like, it's not my problem. Right. Um, so I, I was like, okay, I realized that. And then so the next year people were like, hey, are you going to wear the elf again? And like, like the so delicious chain reached out and was like, Hey, can you come buy a soda from us in your elf costume? And they really? would post it. And like little things started to kind of like to, to snowball. 
I remember actually like we were raising one year, we were raising actual donations, um, for, um, uh, a little girl of one of our sales sales reps that had, um, she was born with down syndrome and like severe heart problems and needed some heart surgery and stuff. And so we wow. threw a big like charity kind of event for them. And so I was actually knocking on doors asking for donations for this, you know, for this family. And, uh, I remember knocking on like Todd Peterson's door, wow. um, you know, own, owner, founder of yeah. Vivint. And like, he comes out and I tell him I'm with Aptive, we're a competitor and stuff. I'm like, we're doing this and this, he cuts me a check. Boom. Like we, we were good. And like, um, and people were driving by looking at Christmas lights. They were stopping like, what are you doing? And it was snowing. It was windy. Like, I'm like, I'm just out here spreading joy, like spreading Christmas cheer. And, um, it just kind of stuck with me. And so as, as I did these, these sub for Santa events and kind of prolonged my Christmas season with this elf costume, it only made sense to take it to a bigger stage. Right. If you, you know, again, the bigger, the more you step out of your comfort zone, the bigger it becomes like nothing is comfortable about that costume. Let me be clear. <laughs> like they're tights. They're not forgiving. It's, it's a full yellow body suit underneath a very thick furry jacket. Right. Like to go to the bathroom, I'll have to take the jacket off, climb out of this body suit. Like literally like I'm, it's really? a commitment. Oh, and yeah. like, and so when well, I feel like the jazz games are already hot, <laughs> dude, they're, they're hot and you're sitting down like down low seats are awesome, but they right. pack you in. Oh yes, they like, do. They pack you in down there and you're, you're pretty, you're pretty tight and I'm a big dude and I sweat a lot. Um, but like for me, it was, it was again, that intentional, I'm going to step out of my comfort zone. I want to get comfortable with this. Right. I want to get comfortable. Like I wouldn't have never done like a, I would have never done a dance off or a dance cam thing without my elf costume on. Right. Like I have the elf costume. I'm like, I'm already, I'm already there. So I might as well dance, do a dance off against a kid or against, you know, someone else and have some fun and, and, and do it. And so the, the elf was a super big success in, in 18, um, or 17, 18, 19. I did it again. And then, um, 2020 pandemic, you know, I, I got like one game in. Right. And then, uh, 2021. So this last season, um, I decided I'm going to double down and I'm going to go to every home game in December in my elf costume. And like there was like 11 games or something. And so wow. I, it was, I packed it in work. I had three different costumes cause I, you know, you have to dry clean them and like you, you can't wear the same costume for three days in a row. It's that's right. gross. Yeah. That's horrible. And already sweating. Yeah. And so, so I, <laughs> I, um, bought, you know, I had three costumes made my shoes, my tights, like my wigs, my, my hats and packed them with me to work in my car and like change. And like, it was my like Superman suit. Right. And I'd, I literally, I would wear it all the way up to the arena. I would, oh, I know. T- you know, typically have a yeah. change of clothes. I'd wear them home. Um, if I went out with the players after, like I remember going out with like Jordan Clarkson and stuff one night, um, after and I, like, they're all in their post game, like sweats and like lounge clothes and stuff. And I'm sitting at their, the table eating dinner with them, like in my elf costume, <laughs> Um, but, Super but no, commitment. yeah. And it's, and so like the, but the, the, the people that approached me about it were like, Hey, like I was having the worst day until I saw you from across the, like the court. I just had to come over to you at the end of the game and tell you like, you made my night. Like it was more fun watching you than it was watching the jazz. I'm like, well, no, like, that's, that's not what I'm trying to do. Wow. But if, if it can spread happiness and have that ripple effect, uh, again, like be memorable, be intentional get uncomfortable, like get, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Like all of those things, like from like my youth, from my job, like it all rolled over to it. And so then I created like an NBA elf, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Um, and I'm kind of going to, going to roll with that. Like I may or may not be trying to get team colored elf costumes made to match the uniforms. Okay. Um, you know, there's, there's a few things that, that, that I, I have to think now, like, okay, I did, I did every home game last year in December. What am I going to do this year? Right. Like, how can I take it up another level? Am I going to fly out to the away games as well? Am I going to start up in, and not even tie it to the jazz anymore and tie it more to like the NBA or just sports in general Right. and start up in Boston and do a Boston game one night, then a, New York game the next night, then a Philly game the next night and like just travel in, in my elf costumes, changing into the clean one every other day and like airports, like having Murphy fly with me and document Heck it all. Yeah. Like what's the next thing? And I mean, you know, getting that on TikTok and reels and Instagram and social media, like that's like, who's going to hate on that? Like right. pe- some people will, cause everyone 
Everyone, always, Everyone has something people to finds say. a way. Yeah. But the the net positive is is this is like I've been given a lot in my life. Like a lot of us been through work. Like I don't think I've ever like taken a handheld. But I I've had a lot of I've I've, I've been blessed. Right. And I want to be able to give back. I want to be able to spread joy, spread positivity, and be a be a part of the change and the solution to like a better world, not part of the problem. Right. And I don't know how many lives I'll impact with my elf costume and like driving around, waving at people, jumping across the crosswalks, like interacting. I mean, that, that was the, the funnest part of this last season was me and the jazz bear um, became, became decent friends, like <laughs> costumed, costumed brothers, That's awesome. I guess you can say. And uh, he reached out and he has an elf costume. I had an elf costume. We, we recreated some scenes in the movie together like the spinning doors, the eating spaghetti with like oh, yeah. syrup and chocolate syrup. And, yep. um, and uh, we recreated a lot of the scenes and then that video actually aired on the Christmas day game um, in like the third quarter and it showed on ESPN. Like they showed really? it live on TV and uh, like, it, like you know, it didn't tag me and it was like the jazz bear stuff, which is great. But like, that was something I wouldn't have ever imagined in 20 in 2009 when I bought my elf costume. Right. Like, hey, I'm going to be on, national television with the bear right like someday because of this and it sounds silly like i'm a 38 year old dude dressing up like an elf but like but it does so it, much good. oh dude it really does and honestly like that's the thing is like you never know what somebody's going through right ever and so do i want to be the person that adds value to their life or do i want to be the person that cuts them off votes them number one and like ruins their day or is the straw that breaks their back and like sends them down into like the pit of despair. Like right. I don't ever want to be mm. that for anybody. Like I want to be that's good a lifeline. And so you don't have to dress up like an elf. Just smile at people. Right. Just wave. Like just thank the person at the checkout counter or thank the server. Tip tip good. Like right. Whatever you do, like leave whatever it is you're doing better than you found it. That's with your family, your work life you know, out to dinner, like the campsite, you know, like back well, it's like, your, well, it's like your personal quote unquote brand. Yeah. Like if you walk into a restaurant and you're like, when oh, the people are like, Oh, he frequents it here all the time. And Oh, great. He's going to be here. Guys get ready for this one. Yep. I mean, that's, a, that's like, that's not a good thing. Yeah. And I hope people, and I've been a server. I've, I've known those people. Yeah. Like, and, and, and I've been to dinner with those people and doing business or trying to do business. And just because of how they acted with the server, I've denied the, the business uh -huh. and I've told them no, because if you treat someone you don't know like that, imagine if you treat someone like me that you do know and, and then money's involved. Yep. And so if you're out there and you want to go to dinner with me, don't be an asshole. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, because I, you know, I, I just won't do that. So Kyle, I appreciate you so much for being on here. You don't even know this is great stuff. And the last thing I want to ask you, I ask everybody this question is success is blank to you. What is success? Huh? <sighs> Man, I can kill bugs. I can sell pest control. I can dress like an elf, but you put me on the spot like that. Yeah. Um. I mean, to me, like, like success is, um, success is a habit. Like, I mean, on the flip side, failure is also a habit. Like, we know we know people that are always going through hard times. Like, we all go through hard times, but right. some people are like perpetually going through hard times. They just can't get out of the rut. Like that's, I think that they, they turn like the cycle of failure into a habit. Right. And I think success is a habit as well. And you, you, you groom success and you create the habit of success through, um, effort and intent. So is your heart in the right place? And are you willing to work for it? Right. Um, are you willing to do it the right way? You know, is, is another big, big oh, yeah. thing. Like everyone wants to win but you have to win right. Like you have to win right. For sure. Um, and that's where, that's where, I, that's how you build a legacy too. Like I don't, I don't want to be known as the guy that, that won. And then later down the years, like gets his biking, you know, gold medal stripped away from him right. because of, you know, doping or, you know, whatever, like, right. And I'm not in, I don't know the whole story and there's whole stories, you know, there, but like, <laughs> sure. I don't want my legacy to be tainted with like winning the wrong way. Right. And so, yeah, I would say I get the like success is a habit and just like any other habit or any other thing that you do to benefit your life, whether it's exercise, 
you know, your eating, your sleep habits, your relationships, like you need to nurture success. And, right. uh, I don't know, does that, does that make sense? Yeah, no, totally, <laughs> totally, totally. And I, I really appreciate that, man. I really, really think that people can learn a lot from this episode. And I, I again, dude, I can't thank you enough. It's been an honor to have you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm excited for people to listen to this. So Kyle, awesome. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. I get mine. I get mine. You get yours. You get yours. Who go